All right, welcome to World History by a Jew. So this is this tonight is a little bit different than our normal uh, lecture. Instead of being a chronological lecture, we're looking at something very specific. Instead of being an archaeological lecture, I mean, I talk about archaeology, but instead of being archaeology, this one's probably a little bit more anthropology. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, ancient Egypt, Egyptian mathematics. Um, the the sources, it, I, I'm going to start us off with the archaeology after I just said I'm not going to do archaeology, but uh, uh, what, would, what lecture would it be for me if I didn't contradict myself? Uh, so there's a few key sources that you need to know that, that all of our knowledge comes from. So really you're talking about a dozen sources on the planet. Um, there's some extra ostracons and this sort of thing, but really a dozen primary sources on the planet is where is everything we know about Egyptian mathematics today. Um, to be specific, I can even cut it down. You're talking about four papyri, one leather scroll, two wooden tablets, and a few key ostracons. Uh, and then I'm going to cut that down even more, that really you're talking about two papyri. You've got the, the Rind mathematical papyrus, uh, which is the primary, and then you have the Moscow mathematical papyrus secondary. So, so the, the Rhind mathematical papyrus is dated to around 1650 BCE. And it's, it, Rhind is just the, the, this Scottish uh, scholar who, um, uh, Scottish scholar who bought it, brought it back to England in I think, the 1850s, 1860s. And then the, uh, the Moscow mathematical papyrus is named after Galinashev and I'm probably killing his name. Hopefully Alex Boehner is on and can correct me if I'm saying it wrong. Uh, but uh, Galinashev was, is, was not just the first Russian Egyptologist, probably still the best Russian Egyptologist. Uh, he brought the Moscow papyrus back to Russia in the late 1800s. Uh, so these are our two primary sources tonight, and I will refer to a few others, but uh, if you're going to look up two and want more information, those are it. So let me remind you, this is what I said actually my very first Egyptian lecture. Uh, the reason Egyptologists are so amazing is they took these something that was written in a different script and a different language with different symbols and, and th these this mathematics really summarizes that right so we're, this all these scrolls they're written in a different language they're they, they have different characters with different symbols for the math it's in a different context they write word problems different ways they use different formulas it's not easy to figure all this out so it's amazing the amount of the information i'm giving you today that's been that's been discovered Okay, so let's talk about the history of Egyptian mathematics. Uh, what's interesting uh, about any ancient writing system is they basically all start as numbers uh, because uh, in your most, the most fundamental level, what do you need a language for? It's, to, it's really for accounting of some sort or another to remember how much harvest you got, to remember how much you have stored, to remember how much taxes you owe. Uh, and so these are your, this is really how hieroglyphs got started. The original hieroglyphs were nothing more than a numbering system. Specifically, they, the earliest ones were tags for containers. So you'd indicate in a container how much grain you have stored in that container. Uh, and this would be dated to around 3200 to 3300 BCE, somewhere in there. Our next story in hieroglyphics, uh, and we're going to discuss this tonight, but the next story that gives us some numbers is King Narmar's mace head. Now, if you remember, King Narmar was featured prominently at the very beginning of lecture two, and we talked about King Narmar's palate. He was the, the king who united Egypt for the first time, uh, circa 3000 BCE. He also gave us a mace head, which uh, I didn't get to in that lecture, but we're going to get to it tonight because it's relevant to our mathematics. And then I want to mention the Ryzen papyrus. I know I didn't mention that above as one of the primary ones. It's not as important as the Moscow and the Rhine one, but the Ryzen papyrus is older. So it dates all the way back to around 1950 BCE. So it goes back a long ways. A um, few basic ideas of, of Egyptian math. So I want to compare it to a couple other systems. Uh, first of all, they use a base 10 system like we do. So for uh, those of you who watch my Mesopotamian videos, you know that Mesopotamian math uses a sexagesimal system, a base 60 system versus us that we use a base 10. The Egyptians also used a base 10, which means you should be doing one of these because it really is much easier to understand a base 10 system. Uh, a base 10 system is gonna calculate just like we're used to. Sexagesimal is like 
calculating things with two Seth Thomas clocks. Uh, and it's just much harder to get your mind around it, even with simple calculations, just because everything's out of 60. Um, now, I will say, though, the Egyptian math uses base 10, but maybe with mix of more of the Romans, because where the Romans have your, the letter I for one and the V for a five and the X for a 10 and so forth, you also will see these symbols in Egypt that represent the numbers. So it does make it a little bit different than, than what we're used to, but it won't be too far off for those of you who are familiar with the Roman numeral system. I, I next want to give you a close up. So this is the, this is the Rhine papyrus. This is the same uh, papyrus that you were uh, looking at on the right hand of the previous slide. And uh, this is from Mark Milmore. He's uh, I featured uh, him on a couple other slides in previous lectures, but I just want to write, I just want to read you what he says, because I really like the way he summarized it better than anyone else. So the Rhine papyrus contains 84 different calculations to help with various aspects of Egyptian life, from pyramid building to working out how much grain it takes to fatten a goose. That's great. Okay, now if you look at this papyrus, you can already see these, tr these triangles, right? So you can guess these triangles probably are some sort of geometric equation, and you would be correct if you made that guess, which is the same thing that e Egyptologists first assumed when they saw it. Uh, and also there are there other shapes too, right? We have a rectangle here and a polygon and so, so forth. Uh, you see this, this square inside a circle is gonna be relevant to us tonight too. Uh, so we're gonna be, the, most of what we're gonna be talking about tonight comes from, from this source. Uh, now, some, let, let's talk about some basics uh, of Egyptian math, starting with the disciplines. So Egyptian mathematics had arithmetic. I don't, I don't think I could do a lecture if they didn't have basic arithmetic. So of course they have that. Uh, they have geometry and they have algebra. Now it has been argued that they have some other modern systems, but no one's going to argue with these three. Uh, it, even though it's derived maybe a little bit differently uh, than you're used to, they have these three disciplines. And then their operations are, the, their known operations are adding and subtracting, multiplying, dividing, fractions, a whole lot of fractions, which we're going to get to, and square roots. But basically what they are is their system is a lot of adding, having, doubling, and a bunch of fractions. That's, if I have to summarize it, you'll agree with me when we get to the, the end of this, the lecture tonight. So, uh, why did the Egyptians use math? Well, they needed for measuring land, all right? They, they, uh, there was a lot of land deals. So you had the temples that would have a certain amount of land. You would have the, the king, of course, would have control over a lot of land, and he would divvy that up to other people. And then by the way, those other people, or maybe just other landowners would then divvy their land up and have people work on it. So there are always land calculations. And we're gonna to go tonight how they did a few of those, at least in a basic sense. Uh, math was very important for estimating harvest yields. So uh, they had a, this great measuring system where basically had a measuring stick by the Nile. And however high the Nile went, the Egyptians would do a calculation that this is how big the harvest should be that year. And then, of course, why would they want to do that? Because that's how the government determined taxes. So um, the, the estimated harvest yield, from, which was related to the Nile flood, which was a measurement, would then be used in a calculation to determine taxes for that year. Also, you needed math for calculating temple offerings. And I think all of you, if I had, if I had done a survey before, what do you think the Egyptians most need math for? I think most people just in their head would say pyramid building. Uh, and, and why do you need math for pyramid building? First, you need to know how the number of blocks you need. You want to know the size of the blocks you need. You want to know the angle of the structure. You want the, the you need actually to build ramps. You got to calculate the size of the ramps to move the blocks. You need labor required to move the blocks. It's the amount of time to build the, the, uh, the pyramid, of course, how many labor hours you need for building the pyramid. So uh, this, this, what most people would most identify with as a math requirement is certainly important. But of course, as those of you know, who've been through all my lectures, the big pyramid building era was only the old kingdom. And we're really talking about math throughout ancient Egypt tonight. I think it's time to look at some numbers. All right, so let's look at the actual numbers. And, uh, and I'm, what I want you to do is I want you to look at this chart here on the, the top left as I'm talking. This is, this, this is your key chart. Now, I'm not gonna test you on this, but I will remind you if you know, if you have any concept of Roman numerals, uh, this will not at all be difficult for you. It's just, it's different symbols. So 
Uh, you have hieroglyphs for a single unit. That's the single stroke right here. You have for tens, you have for hundreds, you have for thousands, for ten thousands, for hundred thousands, for millions. So this is a single stroke, right? And two strokes is two and three strokes is three. You have this arch, which is really a yoke. Um, so this, this arch is a, is, a, is a yoke for like cattle and it represents 10. And then you have this coil of rope, which represents 100. You have the lotus plant, which represents 1,000. By the way, um, you'll always see people talk about lotus in Egypt. Just a funny fact is that uh, Egypt, Egypt, Egyptians didn't actually have the lotus flower. That's, of course, uh, um, from the Far East. Uh, they, it was actually a type of water lily. Uh, but anyway, nonetheless, the lotus, which I'll use the common term, was 1,000. The finger was 10,000. The frog or tadpole was 100,000. And then a deity marked for a million. You would simply combine these numbers just like you do for Roman numerals, and that would give you a number. So if I have one stroke and I have one arch, then that would be 10 plus 1. That's 11. Okay, simple as that. Uh, and of course, now we can look at some more complicated numbers. Like I think it's easier if you look at this diagram, right? We've got that helps some. So if, if in this case, we've got four lotus flowers, so that's 4,000. We're gonna have six coils of rope, that's 600. We've got two yokes, so that's 20. And then we have two strokes, so that's two. So you just add all these up, 4,622. Uh, here's another one if you wanted. So two tadpoles, 200,000, four fingers, 40,000. A yoke, which is 10, plus a stroke, which is one. So 240,000, 11. Uh, and that's, that's really the, the long and the short of it. But the problem with this system is it can get really long. So I want you to look at this. This system works up to around 9,998,999. That's the system and it works very well up till then. Um, but the problem is it gets very long. So in this case, for this number, it would actually be 54 characters to get to it, right? So in our system, we need seven characters to get to this. You would need 54 for Egypt because you would need nine of each of them. You'd have to count out nine strokes and nine yokes and blah, blah, blah. All right. Uh, let me just say, because of how difficult this was, I should say at least how lengthy this was, as time went on, the Egyptians, particularly their hieratic script, did develop special symbols for the more common numbers. But I'm not going to get into that tonight. It's just, that's that's uh, it's uh, beyond where we need to go. All right. Now, I promised you we talk about Narmer's mace head. You had his Narmer's palette in lecture two. Now it's time to talk about his mace head. And we're going to see what we can get out of math from that. All right. This, is, this drawing is the same as what you're seeing here. So I think you can see the coil here from his hat, just so you can identify it. And then over here, you have the, the square with the two bovine uh, uh, animals here. So this, so this is just a drawing of what you see on the mace head. What can we learn about the mace head? So the mace head is depicting a number of plunder and captives that are brought to King Narmar uh, when he, um, after a great victory. And so here's uh, hieroglyphics at work. So right now we have a bovine, right? So this, this bull, for example, has four tadpoles under it. So this means that the, each tadpole is 100,000, so 400,000 cattle. We have a goat. Then we have this deity, which is a million, all right? And then we're going to have four more tadpoles, so that's 400,000. And then you've got two fingers, which is 10,000 each, so 20,000. Then you have the lotus flowers, the two lotus flowers, so that's another 2,000. So 1 million 422,000 goats. And last one, we have captive. So this is the, the hieroglyph for a captive after war. So you have one tadpole, so 100,000 and two fingers, 20,000, 120,000 captives. So already we can see in 3000 BCE, they're using this numbering system. And it's great that even today we can look at it and we can understand what it's saying. Uh, so that, that's the beauty of hieroglyphics once they kind of got this stuff figured out. Uh, now I wanna compare the, the hieroglyphic numbering system with other numbering systems we may be familiar, more familiar with. Uh, so first of all, we have, uh, the, we have Arabic. So Arabic is our way. Uh, it, really, the Indians should get more credit. It should maybe be Indian Arabic, but uh, that's 1965. Let's look at 1,965 in our terms. The Egyptians would write it with one lotus flower for 1,000. They'd have 
nine coils of rope for 900, six, six yokes for 60, and then five strokes. So 1,965, look how many characters they need uh, to do what we can do. So, right, so you got uh, one, 10, 16, 21 characters, but we need four to do the same thing. Uh, now, next, look, let's look at the Roman numerals. See, the Romans don't have it too bad uh, because they are changing symbols for each of these. So the Romans can do 1965 with six letters. The Greeks needed five. Cuneiform, just like us, needed four. But, of course, cuneiform is, is more complicated. Uh, and then at the bottom here, we have Biblical Hebrew. Biblical Hebrew, you needed seven characters to, to, to do the same thing. But I just uh, I wanted you to see the, the comparison of the different systems. Okay, so these are the numbers, and I made everyone feel great because it was so easy to see how their numbering system works. And now I'm going to introduce fractions. Okay, so Egyptians loved fractions, uh, but their their system was different than we're used to. First of all, with a couple exceptions, uh, which I'll mention briefly, all of their fractions are unit fractions. So that's, that, that means they had one fourth, they had one fifth, they had one fifth, but they didn't have two fifths. They had one seventh, but they didn't have three sevenths. They had one eighth, but they didn't have two eighths. And I, I'm gonna explain this in just a minute. We have a term for this and we call it reciprocals. And it's this one over the number. Now, what I want you to see is the hieroglyphs for it, because this is going to come to us a couple times tonight. So the hieroglyphs is expressed with this mouth. All right, you see the, this mouth, and that's the, R, that's the R sound in Egyptian, but it just means part. So if you see this symbol over any number, that means that's the part. That's really the one. Okay, so in this case, we have five strokes, one, two, three, four, five, and then we have this, so it's one-fifth. In this case, we have four strokes, one, two, three, four. We have the mouth, so that's one fourth. You see, it's just this symbol tells us. It can get really complicated though, because I want you to look at this third example. This third example, if you add everything up, right? First of all, we have our mouth, so we know it's a fraction. We've got two coils, so that's 200. We've got four yokes, so that's 40. And then what do you know? We have nine strokes. So this symbol is actually one 249th. Uh, it's not really a common fraction for us today, but like I said, the Egyptians love fractions. Well, fractions in practice. Uh, now, here's where it's going to get a little bit uh, difficult to explain these, this reciprocal rule, but let's look at, um, uh, uh, and, and let me explain why. Not only do they only have reciprocals, but they're using fractions like we use fractions and decimals. And anyone who does basic math knows a lot of times decimals are much easier to deal with than fractions. Uh, the Egyptians didn't think that way. It was always fractions. All right. In the Egyptian mind, each fraction was mutually exclusive. Uh, so let me explain what that means. In a given value, there can only be one one seventh. There can only be one one fifth. There can only be one one fourteenth. Once a fraction took that that theoretical space in an equation, no one else could get it. That was their real estate. So what I'm saying is, if you look at this example, if you have one seventh times four, all of us would say four sevenths, right? It's not difficult. Uh, the Egyptians, that didn't exist because one seventh owned one seventh. You couldn't have another seventh. So you're not allowed to write four sevenths to the Egyptians, nor could you write one seventh plus one seventh plus one seventh plus one seventh because that first one seventh owned the space. Instead of uh, four sevenths, they would then write one se They would say one seventh times four actually equals one half plus one fourteenth. So let me explain uh, that one half in our mind would be seven over 14. So it would be seven fourteenths. So you'd have seven fourteenths plus one fourteenth equals eight fourteenth, which would, we would then simplify eight fourteenths to say four sevenths. Okay, they wouldn't do that whole simplification process, nor are they, were they in the, the business to get the same denominator. Okay, what they want is they, they would leave it to, in, uh, of course, with their own symbols, but they would leave this equation for one seventh times four to them would be one half plus one fourth. So again, they would not have two fifths. If you had one fifth times two, they would say one third plus one fifteenth. This actually isn't that bad. Um, but then when you get to the larger numbers, like 261. So 
instead of two times one over 61, you would get 1 40th plus one over 244 plus one over 48 plus one six tenth. See, each fraction has its own space. You can't invade that fraction space. And because of that, these fractions just get crazy. And these aren't the worst examples. I just couldn't fit the worst ones on the slide. So I left it with these just to give you an idea of how bad it can really get. Um, so how do they handle this? Well, anyone doing calculations daily would have tables to help them along. They had cheat sheets. Um, and uh, these cheat sheets have been found, particularly where schools were uh, so anyone de dealing with these calculations daily would have cheat sheets to show them how to deal with these fractions. They wouldn't have all this memorized, um, nor would it be efficient to calculate it by hand every single time. One other thing to mention before I move on to another slide, because I've said many times hieroglyphics can be complicated, let me just say that all the main fractions, which you see here, all the main fractions actually had another symbol for them. Uh, so the Eye of Horus, which is a very, very famous symbol uh, in Egypt, uh, if you look at the Eye of Horus, they actually broke it up into different pieces and assigned a fractional value to each of these individual pieces. So these were the most common fractions and they each got their own symbol from the Eye of Horus. All right, it's just another example of how they could write the same thing multiple times. Okay, so we did numbers, we did fractions. Now I wanna to up the ante a little bit and I think it's time to, to uh, tackle some other uh, fun topics like pi and zero. Uh, pi and Egyptian math. The, first of all, just to remind you, all pi is is the circumference of a circle divided by the diameter. So for those of you who haven't thought about it in a long time, let me explain. This circle, how long it is all the way across, if you take whatever that measurement is all the way across and you divide it by a line through the center, which is the diameter, that circumference over diameter is pi. Now we know that that value is about 3.14. If you wanna look down here in my sources, I, I brought it out a little bit more for you. Uh, but 3.14, 59, 265, going on forever and ever and ever. All right, um, the, uh, the value that the Egyptians used was 3.16. So this is remarkably close. Uh, really, it's, it's, it's remarkably close that they, they were, that, and, and by the way, this, this value is derived, which I'll get to in just a minute. Mesopotamian, it kind of depends on which sources you look at. Uh, the one that I saw the most was 3.25, but there is, an, there is an argument, I read the paper, that they did have it down to 3.1065, which by the way, I, I think is, is reasonable. Um, and you'll see in archaic times they use three, but just like the Bible also uses three. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to talk about the, Bi the pi in the Bible in one second. Uh, uh, let me just get through the rest of this section. All right, so where do we get this value from? How do we know they had it? It's a derived number. Nowhere is it written in Egyptian script that 3.16 is pi. It just doesn't happen. Uh, what, how we know it is really from the Rhine papyrus. So the Rhine papyrus tells us the area of a circle is one ninth less than the area of a square. Uh, so um, let me show you how to do that. So the we know that the area, we're told that the area, to calculate the area, what we need to do is take the diameter of the circle. Uh, so that, in this case, this is nine cubits. I'll define cubits later, don't worry about it, but uh, that's our main form of measurement. So nine cubits, uh, we're gonna subtract a cubit, so that's eight, right? Nine minus one is eight. And then we're gonna make a square out of that value. So you have eight, you have a square that's eight cubits on every side. So eight cubits times eight cubits gives you an approximate of 64 cubits for the area of this circle. Now they knew this was very slightly off. However, without getting too complicated, let me just say that they then were able to create this fraction from that calculation that to, to get that area. Uh, and that, that fraction is 256 divided by 81. And if we then put this in our terms, that's 3.16, which is pretty amazing. All right, if you really, if you wanna see the, I can send you a paper on it if you really wanna see the, the full calculation. Now, uh, the Moscow papyrus, in a sense, goes even further, even though it's 200 years older, uh, because the Moscow papyrus actually calculates the area of a hemisphere. And anyone who's ever read a book on the history of math knows Archimedes was the first one to calculate the area of the hemisphere. Wrong. The Egyptians did it 1,600 years before he was born. Um, so that this is, they were, in this sense, they were very advanced with math. Uh, now, 
before we move on to zero, I, I want to talk a little bit more about pi, uh, specifically how it appears in the Bible. Okay, so where do I get this value of pi from the Bible? Uh, there is a, if you look in 1 Kings, it says, then Hiram of Tyre made the molten sea, they mean copper basin. He made the molten copper basin. It was round, 10 cubits from brim to brim and five cubits high. A line of 30 cubits would encircle it completely. So what is it saying? It's saying the diameter is this 10 cubits from brim to brim. And then it says a line of 30 cubits would encircle it. So that's your circumference. So mathematicians look at the, this line and, and profits and they say, okay, so 30, the circumference divided by 10 equals 3.0. So uh, ancient Jews believed that pi was 3.0. Um, I disagree with this. Um, and, and the reason I disagree with this is that, um, first of all, the, it was really twofold. A, the ancient Sumerians knew a thousand years earlier that pi was lo slightly larger than three, right? So if you figure Egypt knew that pi was, pick a value, 3.16, and the Mesopotamians knew it was 3.11 or thereabouts, then how can the people, the educated people in between these two empires think it's only three? Um, not only that, you could simply measure with a string. You know, if you take a, a um, tree stump, and you take a string and measure the diameter and then bring it around the tree, it'll be obvious it's slightly more than three. Uh, I think the real reason that it's written like this in, in the Bible is storytelling. Uh, because if I'm Michael Crichton and I'm talking about a dinosaur's leg, we'll say, I'm going to, sorry, his, the diameter of his leg is, is, is three feet thick and, and nine feet around. Uh, so um, he is not going to say the diameter of that dinosaur's leg is three uh, is three point one four difference between the circumference. That's not how you tell storytelling. We're not going to use the value of three point one four in a story. We'll just say three times. So for these reasons, I, I feel confident that uh, our ancient ancestors knew a little bit better than this. But if you Google it online, everywhere will tell you that that pi in the Bible is, is just three. Let's, let's move on to zero. Okay, and so, so zero uh, was a little bit of a simpler answer when I did the Mesopotamian math. But still, let me just give the Egyptians credit. Um, although zero was not a place value holder, right? We already went through all the symbols. I don't need to go through it again. Like we have a zero for 10 and two zeros for 100 and three zeros for 1,000. The Egyptians, as I've already shown you, didn't have that. They did consider zero a baseline for measurements. They considered a good thing at zero. They knew that they were level when they were building something if they went down to zero. They also used zero for accounting. Um, the, I've always read, particularly in any of the books that um, I read on uh, European history, that the Venetians uh, were the ones who invented modern bookkeeping. And maybe they did. Um, but I think the Egyptians should get credit because they also used double entry bookkeeping. So I would say that they, they beat the Venetians by a couple thousand years at least on this. Um, so they would have separate columns when they did their books and they'd have income and disbursements. And at the end of the month, they wanted the total disbursement subtracted from the total income should be zero. Uh, that was the, that was a, this was balanced books of the Egyptians, very similar to what balanced books are for us today. And that's where this comes in. So the symbol for zero is actually this. This is the hieroglyph for Nefer. And you know Nefer because you've heard me use the name multiple times in my lectures, Nefertiti right? Nefertiti was Akhenaten's wife. Why? Because Nefer sounds great to have in a, in a queen or great wife's name. Nefertari was Ramses the Great's wife. There's a lot of Nefers when you look at the, the wives throughout uh, Egyptian history. So not only was it beautiful in terms of a woman, it was also beautiful in terms of math. So they did have an appreciation for, for zero. I think we have to give them credit for that. And now I'm going to go and give you um, another nice little uh, Jewish connection. Uh, and that was was Zero's father Jewish? Um, the Zero was actually brought to Europe by a Jew, and I mentioned this briefly in my Mesopotamian math, but I've got some questions on it, so I figured I'd expound on it a little bit in this lecture so I have a little bit more time. So first of all, uh, Abraham ben Ezra was a, was a polymath almost like no other. Uh, he was a rabbi, he was a scholar, he was an astronomer, he was a philosopher, and he's a mathematician. He had quite a resume. He wrote books on an unbelievable, variety of topics. He had mathematic books, 
books on the Bible. He had books on the Hebrew language, uh, not just the Bible. He had uh, books on astrology, philosophy, and he even wrote poetry, published poetry. All right. He was originally from Spain, uh, and he would settle in Italy, but in between he traveled through France and now it's modern Israel and what's now modern Iraq. He did a lot of traveling in between. He had a couple of very famous close buddies. One is Rabbi Judah Halevi, who anyone who knows rabbinic history knows, knows both, both this rabbi and the next one I mentioned. So, uh, uh, so Rabbi Judah Halevi was not just his close friend, that was for sure, may have also been his father-in-law. Um, there, there's some indications of that. And then also, uh, uh, Abraham Ben Ezra spent time with, with Rabino Tom, and uh, he is known for being the grandson of Rashi and also responsible for many Kassids putting on a second pair of tefillin every morning. Um, now, the, the, what made Zero spread into Europe was a book written by, by, Abraham, uh, by Abraham Ben Ezra. So it's uh, Sefer HaMispar, which means Book of the Number. Again, I mentioned that in the other lecture, but just to give you a little bit more details. It was the first, it's the first known work to bring zero to Europe. He even used Galgal, which means will in Hebrew, as zero. So just like we use this today as zero, so did he. He describes a decimal system for integers. We don't sort of say he brought that to Europe, but it's, it's, a, it's more of a modern system. So what, he, what uh, this rabbi did is he basically took Indian slash Arab math. He brought it to Jews in Europe. And then the Jews in Europe would spread the system to the Gentile world as well. Uh, so in it, very much the zero we use today, we can thank a, a rabbi uh, from Spain for. Now, uh, I think we've covered some difficult topics, but I'm still gonna take it up a notch and we're gonna talk about algebra. So I'm sure some of you are cringing when I say that, uh, but I'm gonna try to keep it really simple. I'm not gonna go into, into any great details, but I just want you to see that they have I broke it down to three topics in algebra uh, that I want to show you that they had uh, just like we have today. Di written differently, but still similar. Okay, so first let's look at the, the, what the Moscow Papyrus gives us. It tells us that this is a word problem in the Moscow Papyrus. Calculate a quantity taken one and a half times and add it to four to make ten. Okay, so in our modern notation, that's three over two times x plus four equals ten, right? one and a half times x plus four equals 10. And then of course we can subtract and derive it. Now, um, the Egyptians would not work it out like we did. They use a term, and the ter this term is modern, but it's called the method of false assumption. That means they would basically guess x. Uh, so to give you an example, let's say they would be, okay, I'm gonna guess x is six, okay? so. So one and a half times six is nine. Nine plus four equals 13. Oh, you know that I'm three off, right? It's 13 can't equal 10. I have three too many. So then the Egyptians would backtrack. Okay, well, I need to use this fraction to get rid of a third of that. So I'm gonna get rid of, of one third uh, of this difference of three and that's two. Now I'm gonna subtract that from six. So I get six minus two equals four. So X equals four. Now that's really complicated. And I actually spoke, I actually talked to you the whole thing to give you an idea of how complicated it is. Because obviously advanced mathematics would become extremely difficult. But for what they would calculate, they were okay with guessing and then figuring out what the difference is and correcting for it. And again, they'd use these fractions all the time to correct for it, which makes it complicated when you look at the problems. I wanna look at their version of the quadratic, of the quadratic formula. So here's another word problem for the Berlin papyrus. The area of a square of 100 is equal to that of two smaller squares. The side of one is one half plus one fourth the side of the other, right? We would say three fourths, you see immediately. We would say three fourths, they can't do that. They have one half plus one fourth. So in our modern notation, we would write down these two things, x squared plus y squared equals 100. And then we'd say x equals three fourths y. All right, I don't wanna go into too many details here, but I just wanna give you an idea that this is represented in modern math and they could do it just in their way. Um, now I wanna talk about equivalence. Probably the most important of these, th of these three, what I would think they would use the most, particularly in artwork for sure, is equivalence. So uh, here's an example. How many loads of strength 45, uh, don't worry about strength, just whatever, that's just their unit. 
how many loaves of strength 45 are equivalent to 100 loaves of strength 10. So this is our modern equation. By the way, I have to use this at work a lot, the, these equivalents. But um, you would take this 100 loaves of strength 10, so 100 divided by 10, and you just set up an equation with 45. You want to equate that with the 10, so you'd have x over 45. Now, where you would see this in art is this picture right here on the right. Um, and this is a grid system, and believe it or not, the Egyptians were very strict on the size and proportions of all their artwork. So for example, a person in Egypt would always be drawn with, a, from, an eight, from a grid of 18 from bottom of their foot up to their forehead. It was always grid of 18. You can see here from the sample to the head, from the neck here, top of the head is three in this grid system. And, that, and this grid was actually drawn out. They would write out this grid system before they did the art inside the tomb. I see this like some of my kids' art books, right? How you break it down into pieces and then you draw each of the squares. So the Egyptians very much did that with equivalents and that was responsible for the consistency in their artwork over so many thousands of years. All right, now um, that's algebra. Let's do a little bit of geometry. At first, I know this screen has a lot on it, but I'm going to break it down into a few key pieces I want you to, to see. Uh, I'm not going to teach you geometry tonight, but first of all, I want you to know about the measurements. I promise I'll explain the measurements. So their baseline measurement was the cubit, uh, and the cubit you see throughout Egypt and Mesopotamia, it varies. So uh, normally, people calculate the biblical cubit as being about a foot and a half. Um, and and I'll, I'll use that measurement for the, for the biblical stuff. Uh, for the Egyptians, it was a little bit longer. Now, if you look here, this is where it comes from. A cubit, and I'll, I'll hold up my hand, actually, if you can see. Can you, so a cubit was from the tip of the long finger to the end of the elbow. That's a cubit. And that would be the, that would be the length on an average person. That's one cubit. And like I said, the Egyptians, it broke down to about uh, 20 uh, inches nine, and nine sixteenths. Um, the, uh, it, it, and now, to give you an idea of what that looks like in terms of size, I took Noah's Ark. Uh, so since the world is by Jew, we use Noah's Ark. We're told in the Torah Noah's Ark was 300 cubits long. So using our rough biblical conversion, that would be 450 feet. So here's Noah's Ark, 450 feet, compared to the Titanic. Uh, here it is compared to a 747. Here's Noah's Ark sitting on a football field, right? So that kind of gives you the, the, the comparable size. It was a big ship. Now, uh, Egypt didn't just go big. They also went small. So that's this next section. And if you look here at this hand, this hand is the key to understanding this. There were seven palms in a cubit. Uh, so if you see here, see this little measurement, and then if you count, there's seven of these all the way up the forearm, okay? Uh, so this was, so seven palms equaled one cubit, and then they break it down even further. If you look here real closely at this hand, there's four fingers. So four fingers would equal one palm, right? So a finger is one-fourth a palm, a palm is one-seventh of a cubit. And they went in reverse, they went bigger. So a het was 100 cubits which is about 180 feet. And in Iteru was 20,000 cubits, which is about six and a half miles. So they went both ways. And by the way, they had, even, they had bigger units and smaller units. I'm not giving you a full thing, I just want you to get a taste. Um, in terms of how they measured area, this is easy for any basic uh, student of geometry. And I'm gonna show you how they measured in an upcoming slide. But um, they used, real, they used what, what we would put simply as one half eighth times height is area for a triangle. Um, and it's pretty simple to see the comparison to if you look at their way of notating it. So one ha so in this case, our word problem, a triangular tract of land has a base of four cat and a height of 10 cat, find its area. Uh, so in this case, we take half uh, times the base, which is four, times the height, which is 10, and we have 20, right? So uh, it works exactly the same. Um, area of a rectangle, same thing they understood was base times height. This one's a little bit more complicated because you have to convert the, the value. So we know that it's 10 het, that rectangle is 10 het times one het, so base times height is 10, but it says here express the unit in cubits. So we've got to convert the 10 het, each het's 100 cubits, so 10 times 100 is 1,000 cubits. You can do the same thing with circles and hemispheres, it's a little bit more complicated, but I already talked about pi, I'm not gonna go into it now. Uh, 
the uh, Pythagorean theorem, I'm getting two credits for it. Uh, I mentioned on the algebra one, I'm going to come back and mention it again and say they also kind of use it uh, in both ways for the uh, for geometry as well. They they didn't lay it out like that. You didn't have a Pythagorean theorem, but they calculated it properly. So I guess that's what counts. Um, now, I want to talk about two ways of measuring, one very simple and one very complicated. By the way, this is, I'm not talking, this is just for reference. That's what I was just, that's a smaller version of what was on the top of the last slide. I just want you to be able to see it as I'm talking about the measurements. So we have two primary tools I want to show you tonight. One is ropes. Uh, and the other is the cubit rod. So the rope, such a simple thing, right? So if you look at this diagram, we've got a rope that has 13 knots and uh, each in between each one is a cubit. So this, this is 12 sections long, each section is a cubit. And where this right triangle was three by four sections with the hypotenuse of five sections. Um, this system was what was used to, met, to survey property. And you have a picture of it here from a tomb in Egypt. You can see here's the measuring rope. This is actually for surveying. This tool is for surveying. So you see these workers are actually surveying a piece of land. So you can see what this rope would look like in action. That's the simple one. Now let's talk about their computer. So this is the closest thing that the Egyptians had to a computer. Uh, the, um, you may see some shows claiming otherwise, but uh, this, as far as we know, this is the closest thing they had to a computer. But this was a very sophisticated tool. All right, so this was their cubit rod. It was kind of like a supercomputer, super ruler, slide rule. Um, uh, I never used a slide rule in my life, but I, I assume some of you have. So uh, this was kind of their version. Uh, there was, this was one cubit long. All right, this was just like what we just saw about the, the forearm, right? This is one cubit long, and then it's broken down into the smaller units. So you had the palms, uh, and you have four fingers equals one palm, and you have seven palms in it. And it, you also could use it for calculating hours. You can use it, you have to cheat sheet for distances. In fact, what I wanna do is actually add a different slide for you to look at, and that's here. This slide is a diagram of all sides of one of these units. So if you look at this, this is the cubit rod, and you can see this is each of its sides. All right, so this can makes it a little bit clearer for you to see. So this whole thing, any of these lines you look at, this is one cubit long. In this case, we've got a palm here, and you've got the four individual fingers within the palm, right? Here's the second palm and those fingers. Now, these fingers then are broken up into fractions. So see, here's our little symbol, right? Our little mouth symbol. So you've got a mouth over three, so those are one-thirds. You've got a mouth over four, so those are one-fourth. So you can read this now. You can understand what it's telling you. <laughs> Uh, if you look here at the uh, up above, you now have the, these symbols. These symbols are the gnomes of Egypt. The gnomes is just the Egyptian word for provinces. Okay, so uh, these are the provinces of Egypt. And then because each of the provinces, believe it or not, actually had variations to their calculations, this is like a cheat sheet on how to convert your measurements between all the different provinces and why they didn't have one standardized measurement, why they needed this, I don't know, but they kept the system for a long time. You have some other cheat sheets here, like the dimensions of Egypt, uh, if you need to refer to something really big. And then here you can actually calculate the length of the day, right? Because an hour moved in ancient Egypt, because during the summer, an hour would be longer. It's one twelfth of the, of, the, of the daylight. So there's more daylight in the summer. So uh, vice versa in the winter. So this right here helped Egyptians calculate how to make that adjustment based on the time of the year. So this was quite a, a, a useful tool for, for them. Uh, like people who owned one of these, they were buried with it. It was like, it, it was something you kept for a long time. It was definitely expensive. Um, okay, so now I wanna show you their multiplication system. Their multiplication system was basically making multiplication into addition. You'll see what I'm gonna say in a minute, how I explain that in a minute. So. It's kind of like just multiplication is more like complex addition. Um, and I'm gonna show you exactly how their system worked. Uh, and I'll tell you, I sat down with my son, Matan, who's 11, and I spent five minutes with him and he was able to calculate like an Egyptian after five minutes. Uh, so I'm gonna to try to run through it with you so you can kind of see how their system works. It's fun. Uh, and we're gonna talk about how it's relevant in the modern times. So I'm gonna look at five, I'm sorry, I'm gonna look at this first one up here and we're gonna talk about 12 times 19. 
So we're going to make two columns, right? We, we're going to, for the, for column A, we're going to put our 12. For column B, we're going to put our 19. Now, for column A, we're always going to start with one. Okay, we always start with one. And for column B, we always bring column B down to, to the to first row. So we put a one and a 19. Now we're going to start doubling this value. So we're going to double one, and we get two. All right, simple. Now we're going to double 19, and we get 38. Now we're going to double two again, right? We're not adding, we're doubling. We're going to double two again and we get four. We're going to double 38 and we get 76. Now we're going to double four and we get eight. We're going to double 76 and we get 152. And then we're going to stop. How do we know to stop? Because the value in A cannot exceed the value you started with. So if we double eight again, we're going to hit 16, which is higher. So you immediately stop. You don't want to exceed that first number. All right. Now what we want to do is figure out which values in column A total up to 12. So this is easy. You have the eight here, right? So that's, that's part of it. Then we have four left and we have the four. So eight and four, these two rows are the rows we need because these two total up to 12. The next one will make that a little bit clearer. All right. So here we go. We have four plus eight, or should, really should say eight plus four equals 12. So we combine that and that's what's gonna give us our, our value. Now, um, since these are the, the rows we need, four and eight, we scratch out the other two. We don't need one, we don't need two, let's get rid of them. And then we're gonna total up what we have in column B. So all we have left are these two rows. We're gonna total up 76 and 152, we get 228. And what do you know? Check me on your calculator. 12 times 19 equals 228. All right, now I'm going to do another one. I'm actually going to do a simpler one because I want you to get the basic system, but I want to go backwards a little bit because I want to be clear. All right, so let's just do 6 times 15. That's an easy one. I know we can all do it in our head, but I just want to show it's easier to show you how it works. All right, so again, column A always starts with 1. Column B starts with the value you're multiplying. All right, next step. This is repeated just because it's simpler. So uh, we'll just jump here. Okay, so now we're gonna double one, we get two. We're gonna double 15, we get 30, right? So we gotta do some more doubling. Now we're gonna double four. I'm sorry, we're gonna double two and we're gonna get four. We're gonna double 30 and we're gonna get 60. But now we're gonna stop. Why are we gonna stop? Because we can't double four again without exceeding six, right? If we double four, we're gonna have eight, so we're done. Um, now what we want is we want to total up uh, this number six. So how are we gonna get to six? Well, it's easy. We've got four here and we have two here. Four plus two equals six. So these are our two key values. That means we don't need the first row. We're gonna scratch out our first row and we're just gonna total up this side. 30 plus 60 equals 90. And what do you know? Six times 15 equals 90. System works. Um, you can use it for much bigger values. I'm not gonna talk you through this one. But uh, this probably is where it's an advantage you watch on YouTube because you can pause it and look. But you can see on much larger values, you can use the same system. And once again, you're going to get the correct answer. I promised you a Russian and modern comparison. And there's, the answer is one and the same. The Russians actually have their own version of this. And, um, and, and so look at this row. This row is going to stay. The top row is going to stay. Uh, and let me jump to the next one. Okay, so here's our top row. This is the Egyptian method I just showed you. This is the first example I did with you. All right, now there is a system called the Russian peasant method. This is real. Uh, the Russian peasant method was thought to be invented around the 1800s. Um, there, the exact origin is disputed, um, but it does seem Russians on, Russian peasants decided that easier than memorizing the multiplication table would be to invent a multiplication system uh, that doesn't require memorization that anyone can do with just a little bit of doubling, basically. Okay, so let's look at the same problem, 12 times 19 with the Russian peasants method. You're gonna see a lot of similarities here. Okay, so first of all, they have one less step. Uh, they're, not, they're not trying to find this answer in column A. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna say, okay, 12 times 19. So first they write 12 times 19, so that's what they're looking for. They're gonna half column A, so half of 12 is six. They're gonna double column B. So, uh, so doubling 19, you get 38. Now they need to go another step. They're gonna half six again, and they're gonna get three. They're gonna double 38. They're gonna double column B and get 76. 
And now let me explain this. They always round down. There's no exception. In this system, you always round down. So if you have three and a half, the answer is three. If you have eight, if you have nine and a half, the answer is nine. In this case, they had half of three is one and a half. So they just write a one. And again, they double the 76 and you get 152. All right, I hope y'all are with me. Um, now let's solve this problem. Okay, so how do we know we're stopping? I don't have to do this calculation to add up to 12 like I did here. I just know I'm stopping because I got to one. When you get to one, you stop. It's as simple as that. It doesn't require any thoughts. There's no processing there, okay? So now I've gotten to one. What I want to do is cross out anything, any road that's even. So I'm not doing any sort of analysis other than to cross out even numbers. So six is even, I don't want that row. 12 is even, I don't want that row. But one and three are odd numbers. So one and three are gonna give me my answer. So I take the value in three, which is 76, the value with one, which is 152, I add these up, that's 228. And what do you know, 12 times 19 equals 228. The Russian peasants method, ladies and gentlemen, you can teach it to your kids and you can do it yourself. Uh, and I, I put it one more example here. Again, I, I'm not gonna go through this one, but if you wanna look later on and freeze the screen, feel free to see how it works in a more complicated problem. Okay, now let's take a look at division. Uh, division is a very similar idea. After going through the multiplication, it's maybe like a slight complication, but it's basically doubling numbers. Uh, and it's very similar to their multiplication. So, and there's a modern equivalent to that that I'll show you. I'm gonna go through this one a little bit faster. Okay, now that you're kind of getting the system down. So let's take 108 divided by 12, okay? So 108 over 12, we're first gonna write a one. Remember the Egyptians always start with that one, just like in their math, they start with, the, with their, sorry, with multiplying, they start with the one, with division, they start with the one. And then in column B here, where the, the, um, the denominator is going to be 12, which is what we start with, all right? Next, next step. We're gonna start our doubling again. So we're gonna double one, we get two. We're gonna double 12, we get 24. All right, let's keep going. Let's double two, we get four. Double 24, we get 48. We're gonna double four, we're gonna get eight. We're gonna double 48, we're gonna get 96. And then we're gonna stop. Why are we stopping? Similar idea, you can't have column B exceed column A. So since we started with 108 and we're now at 96, you know if we double 96, we're gonna be at 192. But it's way more than 108. So we're gonna stop at 96. Now we're going to analyze our results. What we wanna do is get to 108. So I'm gonna total what I need in column B to get to 108. So that's the, our fourth row here, we're gonna take 96. Our first row gives us 12, 96 plus 12 equals 108. These are the only rows we need, or these is the four, first and the fourth. So we scratch out the middle ones, and then we're gonna total it up, we're gonna total up A. So we're just keeping these two rows, one and eight, so one plus eight equals nine. And what do you know? You can check me 108 divided by 12 equals nine. All right. And then I'll, I'll just, I'm not going to go through it like that, but I just want to show you there's another one. Here's a more complicated one, 253 divided by 23. Again, we're going to start with one and 23. We're going to double them. So we have two and 46 and then four and 92. Then we're going to have, we're going to double again. We have eight and 184. We can't double again because then 184 is going to exceed 253. We have to stop and analyze. And at this point, we want, to get to, we want to add up until we get to 253, which we can do by adding up 184, 46, and 23. These three so it, add up to 253. You can take my word for it. Um, and then now that we know we need rows 1, 2, and 4, we just add that up. 1, 2, and 8. That's a total of 11. What do you know? 253 divided by 23 equals 11. So their system works. There is a there, there is a modern equivalent to this as well, although I can't thank the Russians for it. This is the partial quotient method. Partial quotient method works as well and probably should be taught more in schools. But what it does is it teaches you to break up an equation and just and solve it in pieces and then add it all together. So in this case, we have, I'm saying 625 divided by 25. So we're going to start like we did before with this one and the 25, so we we'll always start with one and then you have the 25, but this is where it changes, okay? So first we just wanna calculate what's one times 25, it's 25. So I'm gonna subtract 25 from 625 out of 600. Well, I'll have a lot more to go. So let's break this up into some chunks. If I take another 10 here in column A and multiply that by 25, I get 250. So now I've got 275, 
625 minus 275 is 350. I have a lot more left. I got to get rid of this 350. So I'm going to add another 10. All right. So if I add another 10, I got another 250. I'm going to reduce it by. And now I only have 100 left to go. Then I can, with, un, with only 100 left to go, I easily know that 4 times 25 is 100. I can get rid of that remaining 100. And uh, all I need to do now to know what 625 divided by 25 is, is to add up these, these values that I put for creating the chunks. So 1 plus 10 plus 10 plus 4 equals 25. Uh, and that is the partial quotient method. And it is a uh, useful tool, I think, for teaching in school if, if they don't do it. Here it is in long division, just so you can kind of have it drawn out how we got rid of the 25, then we got rid of 250, then we figured we get rid of another 250, and we got rid of 100, and then we, we solved the problem. All right. Um, now, uh, there's one big subject that I'm skipping, completely not mentioning at all, because when you deal with remainders in division, the fractions become an absolute nightmare. And all of you will sign off if I go into the section on how to deal with remainders. So we're skipping that altogether. Uh, just know that because of the way Egyptians did fractions, it, it got ugly. Uh, but this part looks really clean and pretty, and we can all like it and love it. Okay, so uh, I'm going to summarize here uh, what, what we know about Egyptian math. So first of all, um, some basic principles are everything I taught you tonight, all the formulas I showed are our formulas. It's not their formulas. They had practical math. They had no theorems or postulates. They had diagrams, and they had examples, and they were in tables and they work through their diagrams and their examples and their tables, and that's how they solve math. It, uh, next, they did have a decimal system, a 10-based system like us, which does make it easier, that helps. As you saw from the last couple slides, very lengthy slides, their operations were basically just doubling and halving. Um, and it was okay to guess, completely okay to guess, completely normal to guess. You plug in a value and figure out where you were, um, and that was okay. And you saw this actually with the partial quotient method, right? You, there is some uh, connection to that, uh, even in modern terms. So now, um, they, the Egyptians, I said this a little bit in humor, uh, but the Egyptians used a lot of fractions, and they pretty much figured anything could be fixed with fractions. Uh, and this makes some of their equations get very ugly. Um, but what this really tells you is that due to these complexities, they can never do higher math as we know it. It just would be so out of, over the, I mean, just way over the top. There's just no way you could deal with the, their level, their fractions and their guessing and do real higher math. Um, so I'm gonna make you a little bit sad to say there's no obvious influence on modern mathematics that the Egyptians left us. This was not the case when I talked about the Babylonians. The Babylonians definitely left us uh, with clues of their math. Every time we look at a clock, that's Babylonian influence. Whenever we talk about angles, uh, that's Babylonian influence. Um, this is not the case with the Egyptians. Where we think of the Egyptians and give them respect is the Greeks, even though their math was quite different, the Greeks give Egyptians credit for starting their math. So the Greeks say, okay, um, we, we started with our baseline was the Egyptian math. And the Greeks did great things with math that do have leave us with legacies today. Um, so there's something to be said for that. I think the greatest math legacies for the Egyptians is how they used it to build these great monuments like the pyramids, to build all these amazing artistic reliefs, and they used their mathematics for it. So to summarize, if you'll allow me to read to you, I wrote this, I want to be specific. Uh, Egyptian mathematics was designed to meet the needs of their civilization, and it did that admirably, as proven by their technological achievements in the ancient world. However, it was too limited and cumbersome to allow for major advancements in math and science, the foundations for which were established by the Babylonians and the ancient Greeks. And I will close with a little bit of uh, humor, uh, and that is, what is this symbol? You probably saw this symbol on my poster for this lecture, and now I have it on the last slide intentionally because I want you to figure out what I put here. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a cheat sheet. So uh, check this out and see if you can figure out what I created, my little cartouche for the evening. Um, uh, any uh, guesses? Okay, so the, the reed leaf gives you the E sound. The equals is our modern equal sign. An owl is an M, a basket is a C, and then we have two strokes for the number two. 
So I thought this was kind of a fun way to, to, to end the lecture is this is my own made up way of writing E equals MC squared and higher left. Okay, so that's it for tonight. I uh, hope you enjoyed the lecture. Uh, I'll be back in, uh, as usual, in a week or two with the, with the new video for you. Uh, I, feel free to subscribe to my channel. I hope I'll see you back, at least virtually, see you back for some more.